Good morning. Welcome to Hope Community Church. Would you please stand and worship with us? you guys today um, it's from Hebrews 12 and um, what's really been on my heart this week um, it's been a lot you know there's a lot going on there's a lot happening there's a lot of, of, of conflict brother on brother Christians are separating themselves from one another over their beliefs over their hurts Um, it's hard to watch. It's hard to feel because I feel it, you know. But my verse is uh, Hebrews 12. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders 
and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition for sinners, um, from sinners, so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. So we're here, we're here to worship as one body, as one church. No matter how you feel about COVID, about BLM, we have the same God. We worship the same Father and offer that to you today.
unravel me with a melody you surround me
Lord is my shepherd. You go before me. Defender behind me. Father God, I thank you for your church. I thank you for these people. I thank you for fellowship. I thank you that in this place, God, there's the weary find rest. The thoughtful find 
colloquialisms. That there is peace in this place for your people. That if we seek you, we will find you. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would just move in your people today, that you would use, use everyone in this room as a vessel, Father God, that when they leave and go back to their workplace, when they go back to their home, that they are a radiant beam of your love, God. They are a radiant beam of your light that they are taking into this world that is so full of hate, that is so full of corruption, that Satan tries to destroy us. But he can't have us. He can't have you. He can't have me. God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless Kirk as he comes up to speak, Father. Now, would you just use him? Amen. You know, t- confession, I'm, I'm not a guy who likes music. I really am not. Ask any of my kids, they'll tell you that. I like to play it, and they like to play it loud. And when they're doing the dishes and all this kind of stuff, they don't. And I, like, yeah, it's like, oh, man, music. But man, I love worship. Elijah, thanks for leading us this morning. Thank you for the songs you selected. Thank you for the themes. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your prayer. Um, it nourishes my soul. It's just good to gather on Sundays and worship. Whether it be in person or online, it's good for us to be together. It's good that we do this. Don't stop the habit of doing this. We need to keep doing it. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome Hope Community Church. And welcome to those of you who are here. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning or maybe this week uh, you're viewing this service or maybe it's three weeks since uh, September the 27th when you view this. Welcome. We're glad that you're with us. Um, And for those of you who are kind of new to Hope, uh, maybe you are just finding us online, or maybe you're just gathered here in person this morning, somebody brought you, somebody invited you, Um, the easiest way to find out more about who we are as a church is to just simply go to the church website, hopechurchonline.org. When you go to the website, uh, you'll see on the, uh, if you guys could go to that slide, that'd be great, Uh, you'll you'll see um, on on the top, the banner there, there's several different links. The most important links for you, you guys, to uh, to jump into is to uh, just, just click on the, to, to sign up the new, for a newsletter. That's how you will get information about the church. Um, if you just sign up uh, for that newsletter. And the next and really important link is just uh, click on Alexio um, and to put in your information uh, into the database so that uh, we know who you are, you know who uh, each other are, and there's a, 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 a a directory where you can connect with each other. So those are the, the two most important links there. There's all kinds of information that you can find at the website, but um, encourage you, please, to, um, if you're um, looking to get more information about us, that's the place to, uh, that, that you'll gather that. Um, want to remind you that this coming Saturday is the Arm of Hope uh, banquet. Uh, we'll be gathering in the parking lot. Um, for those of you who don't know about the Arm of Hope ministry, armofhopeingana.org, you can learn more about that there. But um, essentially, we are uh, partnering with multiple local churches, individuals uh, who are providing education, care for children living in the slums of Ghana. Philip Darko, uh, who is our guy on the ground, who is a Ghanaian himself, will be here with us. He actually is supposed to fly in um, tomorrow, and he'll be with us um, for the next couple of weeks, but he'll be speaking at the banquet on Saturday. You need tickets. If you've not gotten your tickets, um, you can go to the Arm of Hope in Ghana. .org website. You can request tickets there. If you know Mike Zimmerman, uh, you can see him today and get some tickets in that way. All right, um, we're going to let our kids head on out down to their classes, and we thank all of you adults who are volunteering and serving kids sixth grade and under. There's a class for you for every kid today, nursery, toddler, everywhere. There's opportunities for you, so thanks to all the adults who are making that happen. There still are a few holes on different weeks of the Sundays, so we're still uh, in need of other volunteers, but there may be a Sunday when your kid may not have a class, so just hang with us as 
uh, Miss Becky works through those details. And finally, for those of you who maybe want to keep your child with you, but maybe don't feel comfortable in here, you like to go to classroom one or two, that is open for you. This service is live streamed there as well. All right. I think I just want to pray before we jump into, uh, into Ephesians. So would you um, continue this theme of worship with me this morning? God, it's so good. It's so good to be together with your people. It's good for us to be reminded of who you are. And it's good for us to talk to you. It's good for us to just open our hearts to you. And so we do that. We do that right now. Jesus, we invite you to be here. We know that you're here. You promise to always be with us. But we invite you from our heart. We say we want you to be here. We want you to fill this place. We want you to fill our hearts. We want you to fill our minds. We want you to alter the way that we think. We want you to change our affections. We want them to increase in you and for you and for others around us. God, may um, we learn to uh, love the way that you love Jesus, see people the way that you see people, care for people the way that you care for people. Would you transform our hearts and our minds more and more into your likeness? I ask that this morning as we look at this challenging topic and investigate your word that we'd hear you, that you'd speak into our hearts, that you'd speak into our minds through your written words. Guide my words. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So Elijah already got us started. I mean, just his very first words, I didn't know what he was going to say this morning, how he's going to lead us. But uh, Elijah's got us started on the theme of this morning. There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of hard things that are going on in our world. And today, we're going to begin a topic of um, great controversy. We're going to jump into politics this morning. Oh, great, right? Oh, man. Can't get away from politics, right? You hear it all day, every day. No, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what news outlet you're listening to. You hear politics. You hear politics. You hear politics. You're watching TV. You hear politics. You have, hear the political ads. You're listening to the radio. You hear political ads. You go to work. You talk to people. They're talking about politics. I know. I know. I know. Many of you are going, like, oh, man. We come here on Sunday mornings to get away from all of that. But the reality is that politics and what's taking place in our culture is something that we have to speak into as the church, and we have to think about how do we respond. There's a lot of tension, and there's a lot of conflict around it, and uh, this is perhaps the most divisive political season that I have ever um, kind of journeyed through, that at least I can recall in my days. The um, focus of this series or the idea for this series came back in early January. It was the middle of the Democratic um, primaries, right? And the gloves had come off and No way like I ever remember seeing Democrats go after each other in the political debate. The gloves had come off the demeaning was in full swing, and the, 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 the uh, candidates were attacking each other and going after each other. And I, and I just thought, you know, if this is happening now in January, what is it going to be like as we get closer to November? It's going to be even worse. So I began to think about and pray about what do we do as a church, and how do we speak into this, and where might we be as a culture? It so happens that in February, um, Pastor Joe and I had the privilege of joining with uh, about 10 to 12 other Evangelical Free Church pastors. There's about eight different free churches within about a 15-mile radius of us, and uh, we get together every other month with other free church pastors, and we get together to encourage each other. We get together to talk about what is it you're dealing with and what are the challenges that you're dealing with. We get together to uh, just share ideas, and so this was February. This was February. This was pre-coronavirus, pre-pandemic. And um, one of the things that we do before we get together is we just kind of share questions that we have. And so I went to this meeting with a question. How are you guys planning to address politics in this 2020 electric, electoral season? 
And so we had an interesting conversation. And as uh, Pastor Joe and I rode back home together, uh, we, we talked about, wow, it's so interesting how there's so many different political opinions even within the evangelical church. And Joe, um, being a guy with creative ideas, said, you know, I got this idea. What if we did a series and we called it something like... Um, why you should vote. I said, why don't we do three topics? Why you should vote, maybe that'd be the first one. The second one, why you should vote for Donald Trump. Third one, why you should vote for, uh, why you should vote for uh, Joe Biden. They go, okay, Joe, that sounds interesting. Okay, so, so I write it down in the preaching calendar. This is back in February. I write it in the preaching calendar. And as we begin to get closer, and Pastor Joe, he checks in with me. And I'm like, what am I preaching? And what's going on? And what's the topics? And, and he's looking at the calendar. He's like, he gets a little hesitant. He's like, I'm not so sure I like that, that, that series that you've got listed there. I'm like, Joe, that was your idea. I, he's like, I'm not sure I want to have to be the person standing up front talking about why you should vote for. I'm not going to tell you what he said. Like oh, Kanye West, right? Why you should vote for Kanye West? <laughs> so I said, okay, Joe, we'll change the series titles and the themes of the series because he's chickening out. <laughs> he's got the mic next week. <laughs> so in all kidding aside, um, th those were the original ideas, but we, uh, we tweaked the series. And the series is now titled, United or Divided, You Decide. And here's what Joe wrote about um, the main focus of this series. He wrote it this way. He says, with every new election, we're left with a decision. It's a choice between candidates who tell us they can fix what divides us. They tell us they will make our life better. They will bring our country together, and that the other candidate will only divide and destroy us. They say, it's up to us, the American people, to decide. But the question for us as Jesus followers is this. Will we allow this election to unite us or divide us? You decide. And so the theme of this whole series is to challenge us as followers of Jesus Christ about how we respond to politics, how we respond to the discussion. Because there's so much diversity. There are lots of different opinions. You know what is fascinating is, is I know people who are evangelicals, solid, good evangelicals, who are going to vote for Donald Trump. And I know some really good, solid evangelicals who are going to vote for Joe Biden. And I've been following, over the past couple of months, these different blogs and different writers who are solid evangelicals, good, solid believers in Jesus Christ who are making the case for why you should vote for Donald Trump and making the case for why you should vote for Joe Biden. And the reality is I know pastors in this community and I, cho I know churches in this community and I know people in this community who are Trump supporters and Biden supporters. And the question is this, Will we allow our politics to get in the way and to divide us as the church? Wow, that's a big question. And so this series, that's what it's about. Will we be united or divided? There's three messages in the series. The first one is this, how did we get here? That's what I'm going to talk about this week is, how did we get here? Next week, Pastor Joe is going to address the question, what causes division and what creates unity? And then in the third week of the series, we'll look at where do we go from here? All right? And the series is going to come from the book of Ephesians. And so we invite you to read the book of Ephesians this week. 
And each week in the series, just keep reading the book of Ephesians. It's short. It's six chapters. Easily you can read the book of Ephesians in the week. If you read just one chapter a day, six days get you through the book of Ephesians. We hope that by reading the book of Ephesians over um, the next couple of weeks, you get immersed in the theology and the way that we're supposed to live out our theology in terms of the way that we interact with each other in the family, as well as in the society, as well as in the church. So read Ephesians over the next few weeks. We're going to mainly focus on Sunday mornings on Ephesians chapter 2 this morning, and 3 next week, chapter 4, and then for the third message will be out of Ephesians 5. But today, today how did we how did we get here? Now, as I've been pondering that question, how do we get here? Um, where I began to think about this was to just ask the question is, where is here? Like, we're going to say, how did we get here? Where is here? And so I sat in front of the blank computer screen with that, that question in front of me. Where is here? And I started to think about that question. Where is here? Where is here? Where, where is here? Where is it that, that we've arrived? And I wrote down, I wrote down this thought. I, thought I, I wrote down, here is broken trust between people and governmental institutions. That's where here is. The people have broken trust with government institutions. Congress has a 21% approval rating. The president is about 43% approval rating. Typically, presidents always have about 40 to 50% approval rating. It's just the way that it is, right? But there is a broken trust between the people and between governmental institutions. Now, it's what's going on right now on the streets every single night. People feel like their government is not trustworthy. And so they're rioting because they believe that the government is systemically racist, right? That's their belief. That's their perspective. And because of that, they feel like, I got to let people know so that we can bring change because I don't trust my government. That's where we are. Here is broken trust between people and the government. There's a whole lot of Republicans who feel like government is not trustworthy because Look at what happened to Donald Trump for the first three and a half years of his presidency with the whole Russia probe thing. And all of that created a lot of distrust for governmental institutions. So here is broken trust between people and governmental institutions. I kept thinking, where else is here? Here is broken trust with news agencies, right? I mean, what news agency can you trust to give you the truth? News agencies, we've come to, to, um, to, to, be pretty, um, to, be, to be pretty convinced that news agencies don't know where the boundaries is. Actually, they've erased the boundaries between what is opinion and what is just fact, what is just information. And so now we have, we have new words, right? We have words like fake news to define news. And we have fact checking, which is on the other side. That's where here is. And then I wrote down a few more thoughts, and then I thought, you know, is there other people out there who are thinking about this? So I just quickly Googled the question. Americans, you know, polarized over politics. And, and I encountered this article by David Blankenhorn, the top 14 causes of political polarization. And he wrote it in the American Interest. I don't even know about this site very much, but I read the article. I found it fascinating. I don't know if the guy leans Republican or if the guy leans Democrat, which I find refreshing because I can't tell. He's just giving information. Here's my thoughts about why it is that America is so polarized. And so these next few thoughts that define where here is are thoughts that I gleaned from him. Here is treating your political opponent as an enemy. He you know, this is where political polarization comes from. You treat your political opponent as an enemy, using violence and chaos as tools for, for social change. Whether that's the, the very acts of violence, like things that are happening on the mobs and, and mobs in the streets of today, or words that are violent. Uh, words like lynching, terroristic, and killing, or killing the president, or holding up images of his head cut off. It, it happens on both sides. Here is exaggerated caricatures and stereotyped views of each other. 
both sides create all kinds of caricatures of the other, coming up with names and nicknames that are demeaning to put down the political opponent. And as a result, those who are Democrats tend to see Republicans as heartless and as racist. And those that are Democrats tend to, to, um, er, uh, to, to see, uh, or, or Republicans tend to see Democrats as corrupt and as socialists. And so they get categorized. And we use, uh, here is, um, is uh, degradation and rancor and aggression in speech. And this is another here, right? The, the way that the candidates in their advertising um, talk about each other. The way in which news reporters and talk show hosts talk about different candidates. Even by us, by the population and the way that we speak on Twitter and Facebook and the ways that we talk about people on the different political sides. We use degradation, rancor, and aggression in our speech. And I thought, you know what, he's right on that. I read it and see it all the time from both sides. Here is acting as if no common ground exists between the opposing candidates. I thought, well, that is really a profound insight. We've gotten to this place where we are so divided that we can't see any agreement with the other candidate. I think it would be so refreshing on Tuesday night if the person moderating the debate between the president and, uh, and Joe Biden would just simply ask the president, is there anything that you agree with Joe Biden on? And Joe Biden, is there anything that you agree with Donald Trump on? Is there anything that we can be in common on? So this is here. Here is where we are as a country. The question for us is how do we, as followers of Jesus, respond to the here? How do we respond to the here of our culture? But more importantly, how do we respond to here amongst ourselves? How are we going to interact with and treat each other? Now, this is um, not new. This whole division and divisiveness and differing opinions, this has been with humanity. Right? People always disagree and have always disagreed. They don't get along. All you have to do is go to Genesis chapter 4 and you find Cain and Abel, the first brothers, not getting along. And it's interesting when you read Genesis 4 and you read the language of Genesis 4, it just sets it up right from the beginning as division, as a different. Abel cares for flocks. Cain he cares for the ground and grows fruit. Abel, he brings an offering of fat, of fat from, from, from his, his flocks. Cain, he brings an offering of fruit or grain from the ground. Abel, his offering's accepted. Cain, his offering's not accepted. Cain doesn't like that. He's on the outside. And so he acts in anger and kills his brother. The first two brothers in the world. That's what they do. And it just keeps going on and on from there, right? You have Ishmael and Isaac, and you have Jacob, and you have Esau, and you have the nation of Israel, all two million of them plus, and Moses, not wanting to follow how he says, this is what God says and where we need to go. I mean, there's been division, and it continues up until today. The division even continued right into the, to the beginning of the church, which is what we're going to look at this morning, Ephesians chapter 2. And if Ephesians, well, Ephesians was written to the church of Ephesus, and if that sounds at all familiar, Ephesus is the church that we looked at with the very first church in our last series, the churches, the letters to the churches from the book of Revelation. And the church of Ephesus was the church that lost its love for Jesus. Right? And we learned that Ephesus was a big metropolitan center, very wealthy, very diverse. And what we find in Acts chapter 19 is that Paul takes the road to the interior while Apollos is in Corinth, and Paul arrives in Ephesus. And he goes to the synagogue, and the synagogue is where he's going to find all the Jews. 
and he spends three months in the synagogue talking with the Jews, interacting with them about the gospel, and Jesus is the promised Messiah. And after a while, they get sick of, uh, of what he's saying. They throw him out, and he spends the next two years at the, at the, um, the gathering place of Tyrrhenius, and he spends two years studying with the disciples who happened to be a mix of the Jews and the Gentiles, some of the Greeks living in the community. And after two years, a riot in the city comes, Paul's kicked out of Ephesus, and sometime later, he writes this letter, the book of Ephesians, to those people, the very people he spent two years sitting around a circle, lecturing and teaching about who is Jesus and how Jesus is a fulfillment of the Old Testament and what Jesus calls us to and the way that we're supposed to live and what it looks like to follow Jesus. He knows these people. He knows their names. He knows the Jews amongst them. He knows the Gentiles amongst them. He's had all kinds of conversations with them, and likely because this is many years after, there's probably new followers of Jesus who are part of this church. But there's a problem in the church. The church, the followers of Jesus. There's a problem amongst the followers of Jesus, and they're divided. And Paul writes to them. He says in chapter 2, verse 11, how do we get here? This is how we got there. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. You, you, you hear it already, this, this language of division, right? Remember that at that time you were separate, divided, from Christ, excluded, not included, you're on the out from the citizenship in Israel. And you're foreigners to the covenant of the promise. You don't have any hope. And you're without God in this world. The you know, language of division, right? The Gentiles are people who are unclean, uncircumcised, unchosen. They're foreigners. They're strangers. They are those with whom the Gentiles were not allowed to associate with. The Jews were not allowed to associate with the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are without hope, and they're without God. And there's just a split. There's a split between the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are on the out. The Jews have God's laws and God's blessing. The Gentiles don't. To say it in the way that um, people living where my wife is from, and they're almost all blonde-haired Swedish, Dutch people. This is the way that my father-in-law would say it. If you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. Right? If you ain't a Jew, then you ain't cool. Right? You're on the outs. Now think of how the Gentiles must be feeling. You can only imagine. You can only guess the perception that they have. Probably something like this, right? You Jews are so cliquish. You're so stuck up. You've ignored us for generations. You won't let us date your sons or daughters. You eat weird stuff, all right? You, you dress weird. Um, your hairstyle's out of fashion. You let your hair grow along on here, right? right? You wear these big, long, flowing, weird robes, right? And you don't have any cool tattoos. That's right, Leviticus 19, 28. Do not put tattoos on yourself. So this is the Gentiles, and perhaps their perspective on the Jews. In some ways, it sound maybe a little bit like a bunch of fourth graders who are told by their teacher, line up, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. You can hear that with a bunch of fourth graders. Ew, no way, I'm not standing next to him. I'm not standing next to her. I'm going to get cooties, right? But isn't it true, though, that in some way we Christians can behave that way towards other Christians of a different political party. Oh, no, I can't stand by him. I can't sit down with her. There's no way I can engage in a conversation with him or her. Evangelicals for Trump, uh-uh, no way. Evangelicals for Biden, there's no way I'm sitting down at the table to have a conversation. Why? Why? Why can't you do that? Why can't you... 
Why can't I, why can't we as brothers or sisters in Christ who have different political opinions sit down and have a conversation? I'll tell you why. We don't sit and talk to each other because where we stand is determined by where we sit or where we stand today is the result of where we have sat in the past. Now that phrase is a phrase that comes from, is, is, is known as Miles Law. It comes from Rufus Miles, who was part of the Eisenhower Kennedy Johnson administration. And he used the phrase, where you sit, to mean your cultural context. Where you sit is where you have lived. Where you sit is those to whom you are related to. Where you sit is how much money you have. Where you sit is a result of the kind of education that you have received. Where you sit is the result of the kinds of schools that you went to to get the kind of education that you have received. Where you sit, therefore, is what you have seen. It's what you have experienced. It's, it's how you see it around you and how you interpret it based on all those cultural factors. And so the Jews, they had their own culture, their own history, their own background that shaped how they saw themselves and everyone else. They were God's chosen people. The Gentiles, on the other hand, they had their own culture, their own history, their own background that shaped how they saw themselves and everyone else. And this is just true for all of us. And what makes it so difficult for us to sit down and have a conversation with someone of, a, of another political perspective, is that you have been shaped by your experiences in life to lead you to conclude to stand where you stand. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's the deal. Are you aware of that? Can you understand that the way that you read Scripture, the way that you look at it, the way that you attempt to, to translate and understand it is shaped in some ways by your own experience from where you sit and that your brother and sister who have read the same passage and apply it a little bit differently love the same Jesus. Just as infallible as you are, struggle just as much as you do to correctly understand and apply it. Can we sit down and just talk to each other instead of caricaturizing each other and using destructive language to talk about each other? You see, here's the deal, right? As followers of Jesus, we're not supposed to just stand where we stand and maintain our own position. No, as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to sit down. We're supposed to sit at the table. We are supposed to sit at the table with other believers in Jesus Christ and to talk with them. You see, because here, where here is, is not an acceptable place to stay. Here is not okay. And it's not me that says that. It's Paul. Because read what he says next. Here is not where we should be. Verse 13, he says, but now, but now, but now because you're in Christ Jesus, but now because you're in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, those of you who are Gentiles, that's what that phrase refers to, those of you who were once were far, far, far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He's made the two one. He's made those who are far, far, far away and those who are close. He's made those who are far, far, far away the Gentiles and those who are close the Jews who have been God's chosen people. He's made the two one. He's destroyed the barrier. The dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. And his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two. Thus, making peace so we can sit down and so we should sit down at the table and talk about where we stand. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. You see, Jesus came and he preached peace to you who are far away, the Gentiles, and peace to those of you who are near, the Jews. For through him we both 
far away and close, Jew and Gentile, for through him we both have access to the Father by one, by one, by the one and only and same Spirit. See, if you're part of the church, you must recognize that where you stand cannot ever be an excuse to not sit down together with somebody else who's a follower of Jesus who has a different political perspective. Because right here, we clearly see, right? As a believer, the dividing wall of hostility has been ripped down. It's been taken down. It's been dismantled. The barrier, it's gone. It's not there anymore. The two, the Jew and the Gentile, the Republican and the Democrat, who are in Christ, have been made one. Both have been reconciled to God. And we both have access to the Father through the one Spirit. And there is a theological and there is a sociological principle that Paul is teaching us in this passage. The theological uh, point that he's teaching is that all men and women, both Jew and Gentile, are stuck in their sin, separated from God. Yet, the work of Christ on the cross enables both of them who have received the work of Christ to come into and have direct access to the Father, through the work of Christ, and through the one Spirit. Theologically, we're all dead. Republican and Democrat, stuck in our sin. Theologically, we're all made one because we put our faith in Christ. Democrat and Republican. And thus, we're to sit down together and be united. And that's the sociological principle, right? Paul's saying that all men and women who are in Christ, that's what we're to do. We're to come together. You see, our responsibility as followers of Jesus, especially in such a toxic season like this, is to demonstrate to our divided nation who is here with all of its rancor, all of its mean-spiritedness, all of its caricature, all of its division, all of its evil speech and evil behavior. It's our responsibilities as followers of Christ to stand in this place of here and to not behave like it and to show the world that we can disagree politically and yet still be united in Christ. America needs to see this, right? It needs to see it on our Facebook pages. It needs to see it on our Instagram feeds. It needs to see it on our Twitter posts, right? It needs to see and hear this message that we can talk together even though we disagree. We can learn to sit at the table. We can listen to each other. We can learn from each other. We can love each other and get up and still differ politically. But at least we're staying united. We're staying one. That's the new here. That's what Jesus wants. That's what he expects of those who call themselves followers of him. Now for this to happen, we need a whole lot of Jesus and a lot less of us living in the flesh, right? I mean, because that, that was Cain's problem. That was Abel's problem. That's what Isaac and Ishmael's problem was. That was, a, that was what Israel's problem was with Moses, right? That's what Ephesus' problem was. It was people living out of the flesh rather than living out of the Spirit. And so for us to get away from here where we currently are and to come over here to this new here, we need the Spirit of God to fill us. What we need is a prayer. A prayer that generates this new here. And Paul gives us that in Ephesians chapter 3. So this is where we're going to end. And I'm going to invite you to take this prayer, to embed it in your heart and minds over the next, what are we, 38 days till election day, November 3rd, and pray this prayer. This is what Paul prayed in Ephesians 3. 14, for the church of Ephesus. And I believe he's praying for us today too. 
For this reason, he says, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. The Democrats and Republicans who find themselves united and connected in Christ are name, were named as God's children, were united with the same last name. And Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. Now pay attention to his prayer. There's two prayers that he offers here. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with prayer. I pray that you will be strengthened with prayer, with, with power. Where do you get this power? He says the power comes through the Spirit. Where's the Spirit? The Spirit is dwelling in your inner being. So this is a prayer. I'm praying that they will be strengthened with power. And that word strengthened is the opposite of discouraged. It's to be encouraged internally with a whole lot of energy. Inwardly, we're encouraged, we're, we're confident. I pray that they may be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being. Why? So that, this is the prayer, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts and your faith. Do you get it? God, we need Jesus in us, right? For us to, to, to be able to sit down with people of different political views and to behave in a different way, we need to behave like Jesus, right? We need to have the eyes that Jesus had, the mind that Jesus had, the attitudes that Jesus had, the actions that Jesus had. We need Jesus to dwell in our hearts, in our minds. We need to see, feel, and think the way that Jesus does. And he prays. And this is what we need to pray. We need to pray this for each other. We need to pray this for the church and, the, and, the, and, the, and all across America. Jesus, would you strengthen us with power so that you may dwell in our hearts through faith so that we can sit down together and then get this next prayer. And then he says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, you've been rooted and established in love, my prayer is that you may have power. There again, another power word, you have power up above. My prayer was that you have power that Christ may dwell in you. And here it's power together with all the saints, Republican and Democrats, together with all of you. You might have power to do what? Power to grasp. To grasp what? To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is what? The love of Christ. His prayer is that we can grasp the massiveness of Christ's love for us who was on, the, uh, there was a dividing wall of hostility between us and him. And he loved us so much that he demolished that to come to bring us into relationship with him. And he says, his prayer is that we would get that, that we would have that kind of love that Jesus has. And that we would not just be able to grasp it, but that we would know it, verse 19, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What our country needs and what the church needs is a bunch of Jesus-filled followers of Jesus Christ who grasp how deep and long and wide and high is his love. And then we need to behave like that to each other and with each other. You know, it doesn't matter your political views. It really doesn't. You should have a political view. You should know where you stand. You should be able to defend it. You should defend it. But you should not ever be unloving to somebody else. It's not acceptable. And so if we want to know what God's will is in this election, I'm pretty confident. I don't say this very often about what God's will is. I'm pretty confident I'm absolutely certain that God's will for us is that we pray this prayer and we live like this. Hope Community Church, in this crazy, crazy world we live in, with this ugly, ugly here that we're in, this is our culture, will we create a different culture that's here? And will we depend upon Jesus to do it. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we confess 
that we too often are guided by our flesh. We too often want what we want. We're too often convinced that we know what is right. And because of it, we end up behaving badly. We end up behaving wrongly towards each other. And we confess that. And we ask that you would, you would just strip that away from us. That you would give us increasing eyes to see within our hearts and our minds how we live in the flesh, how we live dependent upon the flesh, how, how, how we're choosing to act out of the flesh. This week, as we're on Facebook, as we're on Twitter, as we're listening to the news, as we're listening to political candidates, put a check in our spirit when we hear the mean-spiritedness and we're tempted to go, that was a good zinger. Check us on that. Check us when we're standing in the workplace and, and somebody offers some caricature, some demeaning comment to somebody of the other side and just help us to say, whoa, 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 that's not appropriate. Spirit of God, stretch us, grow us, let us grasp the depth of the love of Jesus Christ. Use us, just as a little Hope Community Church and little old Mount Joy, Pennsylvania, to be a light in our community that brings transformation here and throughout the rest of our nation. It's in your name, Jesus, we beg you for these things. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and worship with us? song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
my eyes in wonder and show me who you are in me. You know, those words are very powerful words, and I hope they are words that you were singing. Jesus loves you. (laughs) There is no one like Jesus who loves the way that he loves. I hope that your affection for him grows and increases. There's no bigger brother that you can have that could be better model or example than Jesus Christ. Attempt to live like him. Love like him. And may he lead each of us into the lives of others where we can show them that love. Go this week, Hope Community Church, in that kind of love. And we'll see you next week.